Welcome, everybody, to the Brian Foltis Behavioral Finance Podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Foltis. I serve as an associate professor of finance at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana. But today, my goal is to teach you about social norms, these unspoken rules of society. And today we're gonna to talk about the implications uh, for life in general, but then also talk about some of the financial implications of the social norms that we see around us. So thank you very much for watching today, and I hope you're doing well. We are in summer mode right now, which for me, at the end of this summer, means that I feel quite refreshed, also means that my boys are going into school. They start about three weeks, uh, three weeks about earlier than I do. So when I ship the boys off to school, going into eighth and fifth grade this year, that means I start shifting into my school mode as well. So I'm getting ready to get my classes started and prepared everything and set to go. And part of that is doing some more podcasts, getting the course content complete. There you go. There's a tongue twister for you. Course content complete on the podcast before I start my real course in the fall, which means we have this podcast to talk about social norms. And then I'm anticipating about three final podcasts to complete the course content. This is going to be a deep dive into retirement and retirement savings and retirement decisions. All of these things packed into one. And then the final chapter or the final section that we talk about to complete this course overview is going to be on debiasing strategies and how we can help ourselves debias ourselves and others around us. That will round out the overview that I was trying to set out to do right at the beginning here as this podcast evolves and tries to, we try to figure out where we're going to go with this. It's starting to become more clear to me now, and I'm getting really excited now to talk about some of these other aspects. And part of that is mental health and what it actually means to be rich. And this has been something that has changed in my life over certainly over this past year, as I've really have sought out help and tried to work on my own mental health and what everything, how it all ties together and uh, what truly being rich means. And it used to be, it used to be a number in a bank account, how we could quantify it. That's where my mind likes to go into something maybe a little bit more that, yes, financial wealth is a nice benchmark. It's a good marker, but that does not mean everything about living a rich life. As we can see, people, you could have a lot of money in your bank account, but if your fitness level is off or your mental health is off, well, what's it all for? You're going to be miserable anyway. You're just miserable with a lot of money. So that's where we're going to be going. I've got a lot to share, a lot to talk about, and uh, lots going on in my life. This has been amazing summer. Typically what we do in the summertime is do a lot of traveling. And after spending a number of years over in living in Europe, lived in Germany for almost six years, we'd like to go back over there. Once you get a taste of that travel life, kind of like an addiction where you want more and more. And so we use the summertime to travel over there quite a bit. And last summer was a big dive. We did six weeks end to end in Europe, traveling around. That was my fiance, Mandy, you see over my shoulder here, uh, her first time in Europe and she got six weeks over there. This summer was a bit different where we moved into a new house and I called this summer the summer of work where it was all, wasn't all about fun and travel. It was more about doing, laying some groundwork 
And for me, that meant laying groundwork for the podcast and my consulting business. It's a lot of work that goes into it. And also the basketball card, the trading card side business that I've built up as well that has taken some time over the summer. And I brought the boys into the equation as well. The summer of work for them meant the older one doing video editing for my podcasts and trying to create shorts and all the different things that you do as a content creator in 2023. And then I also have my younger one helping me with the cards. He helps me price them. He helps me determine which ones I should get graded, which ones I should just sell. And he's more or less my business partner when it comes to the trading cards. That meant whenever they're with me, they get me, they're with me, their dad, half the time. On those weeks that they're with me, they're up at nine o'clock in the morning getting to work. And then when we are done, we eat lunch. So they basically just working a couple of hours every day, but they're earning an income from doing that. And then they, we were going to the workouts, going to the track, doing work. So the younger one is a soccer player. Working on the left foot is something that a lot of players know they should do, but don't actually want to do it. And I know it's not always fun to do, work on your weaknesses, but we would go work on our left foot. The older one was doing track workouts where we would go 400 meters. Um, how many times would we do that? We would go six times, 400 meters, one minute in between. And we would try to do 50, 50%, two times 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% going around. The key there, if you don't want to die on those last couple, you truly have to do a 50%. And sometimes we would get burnt when we would get off to a good start and start with 70%, 70%, and then try to get through the end. Anyway, it was uh, a really good productive summer. And I've noticed the boys not only building a little sense of purpose, but also confidence in their lives with providing that structure and providing that, that purpose behind what we were trying to do. And I know the older one was saying, dad, why are we working out at the track? I've got conditioning and working out with the football team at 3.30. said, well, we're going to do extra. You're going to do double. And at first he was thinking all oh, that, oh man, that sounds like a lot. But then he started realizing that, oh, that extra work actually pays off. And now that second conditioning became a lot easier because it was a lot easier than what we were doing at the track. Anyway, we are at the end of that. They are going to school tomorrow as I'm recording this here in the beginning to mid uh, August, they're going to school tomorrow. I, the old professor, am getting married again later this week, and we're going to do a very unceremonious second wedding. So it's basically me, her, the two kids, and the official and a photographer, and that's it. And keeping it very, very simple and right to the point. And we're going to make Mandy of Foltis. Make that official. I'm very excited. And we're going to push our honeymoon to leave the Christmas holiday break that we get over the new year. So really excited about everything and just wanted to give you a nice life update because actually life is happening. It, I know behavioral finance is a lot of fun, but sometimes understanding a little bit about the creator behind the content and understanding me as a person this because finance is a sensitive subject. We have to be an open book and not just a, a shell. And then I expect you to share everything with me. So anyway, here we are today talking about social norms. I like teaching social norms in class because 
what I get to do is I get to wear my workout clothes to the lecture. Now I do this for an intentional purpose. It's to show them that there are social rules that if I'm wearing my hat and gym clothes, I've got sh gym shorts on, I'm literally this morning going to head to the gym after I'm done recording this podcast, that I stand up in front of the class and everybody looks at me and goes, what are you doing, Foltis? What, what now? Because this is at the end of the semester. They've seen, they've heard all of my antics. And uh, that's why I have to put a disclaimer on my, my podcast because I introduce myself as an associate professor of finance at Butler University. But then I also have to put a disclaimer at the bottom saying, the content below is all mine. It has nothing to do with Butler. This is just my my content here, separate from my my job. But anyway, if you are in class, you see this, and what's what's going on with your dress? Why are you in gym shorts? And I'm normally used to seeing you in at least a a dress button-down shirt or a polo and, and dress jeans or dress pants or something like that. So what's going on? Well, that's my introduction to social norms. These are the unwritten rules of behavior that are considered acceptable in a group or society. The unwritten rules of behavior. I want you to think about that as you move forward in your day-to-day. Think about all of the unwritten rules that we see around us that for the most part are going to be good. They're going to serve the greater good. But then I want you to be aware of those that aren't always that good that we need to be aware of because sometimes we're going to need to step in and say, wait a minute, why are we doing this? This doesn't make sense. I'm not sure if I want to follow this. One of the, so why would we follow social norms? The way that these are set, and by the way, the social norms is just a piggyback off of this conformity conversation that we were having in our previous episode. And we conform to a certain set of standards. Social norms are kind of the, the unspoken rules of these things that we conform to. And the general rule is it's a good thing because, and we follow these because we want approval, we want acceptance, and we want to belong. With all these three things, it makes sense why we wouldn't want to want to shake the boat and or rock the boat because this is just a comfortable way of going. This is the smooth path. And if we don't, the consequences of not following social norms is the opposite, suffering from disapproval, being banished from the group, or being an outsider from the group looking in. It's something that takes a lot of courage, and if it doesn't work, then you have to be comfortable being outside of society or the norm of the group. And so those are the reasons why the benefits of some of these social norms is it creates an unspoken standard. It's Think about going back to our type one, type two way of thinking. It's uh, orderly and predictable. It's smooth for our brains to think about. It doesn't cause a ton of cognitive dissonance. It just, we go with the flow. We take a look at our surroundings, we adapt to it, and we blend right in. It feels very comfortable. It's all inclusive. It's comfortable. It's predictable. All these things make us feel accepted, comfortable, and that's why we fall into these. So I'm going to point out some social norms that, that we just see on a day-to-day -day basis, and then I'm sure, I'm hoping that you can add to the social norms, and we're going to talk about financial norms as well. Before we jump into that, just understand that norms do and can change over time. And they can change over different cultures and in different situations. 
Social norms can change over time, cultures, and different situations. Think about your public behavior. Public behavior, how you actually speak, the words that you use. And I want you to compare how you speak and how you talk at a bar or at basketball game. I know football season's coming up. How you would talk at one of those venues or situations compared to how you would talk at if you were to go to church or if you were having dinner with your parents or your grandparents, how would you talk there? And the phenomenon is, well, why would we be different? Why would we, we should just be ourselves at all times. And that's the whole point. You should, but we're not because there are these unspoken rules that we can speak different things when we're at the bar or at a football game than we could when we are at church. Um, thinking about how we dress, same thing. How we dress at a bar, how we dress at a, at a church. But also, why is it acceptable for me to wear these clothes, my athletic gear, when I go to the gym? If my students saw me at the gym, they would, hello, how's it going? Hopefully. And we would, would, they wouldn't think twice about it. But it, when I stand up in front of the class and give this lecture in my gym clothes, you can see them wrestling with, that's just not how he's supposed to look. This is totally different. He's supposed to be dressed like this. And I have in my mind what it's supposed to look like. All of my other professors dress a certain way as well. There's a standard. And now it's in conflict with it. And my question to them is, why? Why is that? And this all just goes back to these unwritten rules that we have in our brain and that we actually execute for the most part. And I think about my students. So as, as social norms evolve over time, I can think of old movies that I watch that have students dressed really nicely in their ties and over time they wear jeans or, or khakis. But now, and I'm not picking on them because I don't blame them, we get mostly sweatpants, yoga pants, athletic pants, and sweatshirts, t-shirts based on the weather. Very, very dressed down compared to how it was in the past. I think it makes rational sense because there should be no, there's no incentive for them to dress up or give some appearance. Even when we do presentations, the only dress code that I implement is dress as if, if as I do, and uh, don't overdress the professor. So if you've got dress jeans and a dress shirt on, that's fine in my class. But think about social norms. If you're studying for an exam at a library, how you would dress compared to going to an, a job interview. That's one of the things that we're not gonna to try to push any social norms at a job interview. You're gonna dress the part and dress differently than you would in most other situations. Another thing here, phone etiquette. This has evolved over time as well. Obviously now the main mode of communication is via text, just texting, using our thumbs, compared to making a telephone call. It's very rare that my, text to call ratio is very, very high. And only rarely do we do a phone call. If, if there's just something that's multidimensional, that's when you use the phone call, phone etiquette, social norms. When you pick up the phone, what do we say? Always say hello or some sort of greeting. We have goodbye, some sort of salutation or whatever it's called at the end. Some of these unspoken rules of how we have etiquette in the beginning and the end of some of the phone conversations. And I know this has changed over time because I can tell you 
from memory the phone number of the top five friends that I had growing up and of their home phone number. And I can barely remember my fiance's phone number that I've had for two years and my son's who just got his iPhone on his 14th birthday. I don't know his number. I don't even have any idea of what that is. Oh, this has all changed over time. And now we've become so enamored with our phones and how we even interact that I call them zombie groups where you have people walking together or are together as a group and they're all on their phones. And so they're just like walking zombies together, no awareness of anything else. And I'm always super curious, oh, what, what is so important that is on, on their phone? I'm, I'm always fascinated by this because in my life, man, I, I love my phone too, but there's just not a hell of a lot that's that important that has me in there. And I try to be cognizant not to get sucked in to that TikTok life and, and understanding the dopamine that they're trying to inject and get you addicted to. I understand that. So I try to keep it away. But man, those zombie groups absolutely fascinate me. Uh, when we talk about different cultures, I've got to experience the German culture and uh, love how black and white things are uh, for the most part. There's no gray areas. And we even see this when you are walking in a in a large city that if it says red, the crosswalk says red, you just stand there and it makes no difference if there are a ton of cars pouring through or if you don't see a car for another mile. If that says red, you nobody goes. And if you break that rule, you can almost count on one of the older members of the German population to yell something at you saying that you are breaking the rule, you're breaking the law, you can get in trouble for this. And only when that light says green, should you go no matter what's happening. So there's this blind coherence still to black and I guess it's red and green rules. And I've always thought when I was living in Germany, I always figured I'm going to save, if I save a minute for every stupid red that I'm going through, then and I do that five times a day, five days a week. So there's 25 minutes. And if I'm doing that 50 weeks out of the year, and I'm about a 20 to 25 hour time save, one minute at a time. And I can turn that into a, a number based on a monetary number based on how much I'm earning. And I ask somebody, wait, how much would it cost if a police officer would actually pull me over and say, you walked on a red crosswalk? How much would this actually cost me if I got a ticket for this? And they said, oh, uh, 10 or 15 euros. I said, okay, bring it on. So that meant that even if I'm making 20 euros an hour net, trying to do the math, and let's just say it's 20 euros with inflation for a ticket. Based on my math, if I'm saving 20 to 25 hours, I'm going to need to get 20 to 25 tickets in order to just break even. So that once I did the math, I'm going... I'm zipping through there as long as I'm a grown ass man and I can see that it's safe. I'm going to go walk that red and I get yelled at by people and I'll wave at them. But I, they, for me, it became more of a expected value proposition. And I also would love to see a German police officer pull me over and say something. Cause even after five years, what I could always do is go, ah, or say something so stupid, so only English, and just be this stupid, naive American. <laughs> and 
So I've always, in my mind, I've always wanted that to happen and never did, unfortunately. But when you're in Germany, there's another example of, of saying, how are you doing? So wie geht is, is what you would say in German. And now those of you in the US, if you are at the grocery store or anywhere in passing, what do you say to people? Hey, how you doing? I do at least. How's it going? Good. I'm great. Right? And when we're in Germany, if you were to actually say, ah, wie geht's? What you're actually it's a literal meaning. Uh, they take it very literally. How are you doing? Which means you are going to get a very honest answer about exactly how they are doing on that day. Never know what you're going to get. And you only ask, how are you doing? Obviously, because it's an honest answer to those that you really know and really want to know how you are doing. So in the US, we would say, how you doing? Good. That's great. Okay. How are you really doing? That we have to come back and ask it maybe a second or a third time. But you know what? Woke up this morning, I don't didn't feel that great and struggling with this. And I've been stressed out a lot about this and the other thing. But you know, I made it out of bed and sometimes a struggle. And we're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just said. I just wanted you to say you're doing great. I'm doing great. And we move on, even though we know there's a lot more to it. So different cultures even have different interpretations of the same phrase. Continuing on, talking about dining and these social norms and why we do these things. So why is it that we have to eat an appetizer before the main course and then we eat the dessert. So the intuition makes sense, right? That you want to eat the good food, the warm up, and then you have the main course, and then you eat the sweet stuff later so you don't fill up on the sweet stuff, and then when the good stuff comes. I get the intuition. But we stick to these rules so steadfast that to even think about having dessert beforehand, oh, that would just be insanity. Let's think about this. So, and then also thinking about what else do we do? Napkin and lap. And, and then we wait till everyone gets their food. So in the Midwest, we're all very, that's our rule at, at my house. We wait till everyone has their food and the cook sits down. The, the joke in my house is not really a joke because it was real. Now we've made it a joke is whenever I'm cooking dinner or whoever's cooking dinner, anybody need anything? Silence. As soon as I sit, I need this. So now it's a joke. As soon as I sit down, because now when you're 14, I'm going to tell them to get them, get it your damn self. Why am I and why am I getting this for you? As soon as I sit down, I'm done, you get what you need, but wait till everyone gets their food. Why do we order our drinks first and then get food? That's also the sequential order that we see, namely in the United States, that is just an unspoken rule that we abide by. You can see all these things around us, and there are many more that, that we have, and I would love to hear from you whatever you are seeing in your life. I love hearing these unspoken rules, thinking about passing on the left-hand side only on a highway. That's something that you will see only in Germany on the Autobahn. The 465, which is the highway that gets me from suburbia Indianapolis down to Butler is about four lanes. And it's just what I would call a four lane free for all. I only have about five miles on that particular stretch of highway, but it's more or less a free for all where you've got people, trucks, cars, 
coming on all different angles at all different speeds and you just hang tight and you try to get to the other end unscathed. But now let's talk about investing. All these social norms of investing, how they, how those play out. This is just what I'm seeing and how it's evolved over time. We see this uh, herding, following the herd. And some of this we might call momentum, but I also see this herding behavior. And the greatest example of this is on Reddit. And we've seen these meme stocks rise, burst, and now they're kind of holding in a, a strange holding pattern. And just getting enough people to buy into it starts with a few leaders that are the first movers and see if you can get the crowd to, to follow you, even if the stock doesn't even resemble what it should be fundamentally, doesn't matter. And this herding mentality also says, I don't care what the fundamental price of anything is, as long as I can sell it at a profit, Who's the, who's the smart one here? doesn't matter what the fundamental price is. I can still profit. We call this the greater fool theory. I can be foolish for buying Tesla at $500, but as long as there's a greater fool that I can sell it to at $700, who's the fool? I, I'm making a $200 profit. <clears throat> so we see this as long as there are unspoken rules of following Wall Street bets or herding. Uh, we see this with, I, I, so Bitcoin is one of the things, the cryptocurrencies, we've talked about this in a, a previous podcast that we don't know where this is going to be. It's hard to fundamentally price. So we don't know what fundamental value is, except for you get a lot of people coming out here saying, oh, so frustrated. Because on Instagram, my goal is to help people and to educate people in the way of behavioral finance, which is adjacent to personal finance. It's all about financial decision-making. So you get people reaching out on Instagram and sounds innocent enough, profile looks fine, they're, they're interested in finance. And then you realize, it's another damn ploy to get you to talk, to get you to try to invest in Bitcoin. And these bots or whatever the hell they are, they say, well, you put in $1,000, I will profit 7,000. Oh my God, do you even know who you are talking to? And usually I'll, I'll say something and I'll block them and, and move on with my life. But if I'm a normal investor and, and I'm getting these things and that just becomes the norm, I'm going, I guess I'm just going to believe this because enough people are telling me that if I put money in Bitcoin, I am going to increase my money by sevenfold. And so I'll just invest in this unregulated, insecure currency that people tout as, as uncentralized and totally secure. And... Uh, Anyway, we're going to leave that alone. Electronic bank runs we see all, all as well now. This is kind of a, un, I don't know if this is unspoken rules or not, but it's a new reality and it's a thing now where we had this back in March when Silicon Valley Bank went down and we realized that banks could be solvent on paper one minute and literally a few minutes later, they could be insolvent on paper because people electronically can pull out their money that quickly. And if you get enough people doing it at the same time, heading for the exits, you can be insolvent within an afternoon. And that's what we saw. And the real scary part about that was that could have been any other regional bank. And that was about to be any other regional bank. 
until the government came in on that Sunday night and said that all deposits of all amounts are insured. I remember reading that in Puerto Rico as I was meditating and in a really Zen, like for the first time in my life, was really relaxed, was just accepting myself for the first time and was really like, oh, this is so wonderful. It was a six day trip on my own. And I remember that later in the trip that evening, I pull it up reading about Silicon Valley Bank and thinking to myself, when I fly on Monday, will we have an economy? that is actually gonna be stable, that people are gonna get paid on that Friday. Uh, that was a real question that I had. And I think a lot of people were, in the finance industry were having that same, those same questions until the government came in and put it in that backstop on that Sunday night. So then things were able to resolve themselves or iron themselves out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so that's a new thing. I've talked about meme stocks momentum trading, Bitcoin. And, and so you see these herding mentalities, you see social norms coming around that. It's a comfortable place to be in. If everyone else is doing it, that's where you feel comfortable. So even if you all lose, we're all gonna go down together. We're all gonna lose together. And there's kind of this a little bit of strength in that. And on the opposite side, taking the opposite side financially is very lonely. It's very unpopular. And even if you are right in the end, you are going to be losing up until that point, alone, unpopular, and on the wrong end of it. So there's a reason that many people don't attempt it. Even those who called the financial crisis, you can call it all you want. But if you don't put your money on that side, then you're not really benefiting from it. You're just standing in the crowd going, I don't think we should do this. But you're still going down with the crowd anyway. Nobody likes to lose money alone. And that's why we don't see too many contrarians stepping on the other side of these trades. In financial decision-making for your personal finances, let's talk about that. We've got keeping up with the Joneses. I see this in my life every day here in suburbia, Indianapolis, where you have people, I see houses, people buying these big houses, um, the cars and the amount that they're paying on their car loans and just building up hundreds of thousands of dollars in expenses. Even if they're making a good income, they're spending more than they are making. And this is just an unspoken rule. Hey, I've got to have a new car. Or I, the unspoken rule is we all have car payments. And we all have big mortgages that we can barely afford. This is the way it is. Even to the point where when I went and bought my car, I got like a seven-year-old car, about at the end of taxes, it was about seventeen, eighteen, seventeen thousand dollars, eighteen thousand dollars, and I said, "Okay, um, where where do I wire it to?" And they looked at me as if I had three heads coming out of my shoulders, and they're like, oh, "I I haven't I don't remember this process." So even the the man behind the screen, the desk, came out and was like, "Okay, I think this is how we do it. I think this is where we wire money to," even though. We haven't had this in a very long time. Like People don't come in and just pay for this in cash so we don't have a car payment anymore. And apparently not. And this is a whole other thing where we're going to talk about, are you okay stepping outside of social norms? So this is where we have to understand where these car payments, we have to be aware. Type 2 thinking has to come in and say, I don't think that's right. Wouldn't you rather take your seven, eight, nine hundred dollar monthly payment and invest it somewhere or put it to it an experience or something that's not a car? So the car that I have, I said, is seven years old. I had the option. I could have gone with the same model and had 
five years, seven years, could have bought it new, taken a loan, paid double for it for a seven year difference and 80,000 miles difference. Could have done that and had that, that trade off. But now I have a reliable car. I like it and it's great for me. Nobody's embarrassed by it anymore. And I'll run that thing into the ground with no car payment. And when that time comes, I'll buy another one. Probably by then I'll have more wealth and I can pay even more for a new used car. And on and on we go. But I have to step in and say, no, this social norm of what I see in the school parking lots and I know what I make per year. And I have to under, I have to believe that I'm on the higher end of what people are making. So, and I've seen the numbers. I think I make double what the average is in my county. That's just me before uh, Mandy comes into play. And so I realized that it's not an income thing for everybody. It's, a, it's an overextension that people believe I've got to have the best car for what? So you can stand in a, sit in a parking lot, I guess. We need to be cognizant of that. Also, this unspoken rule that we all have to go to college and we all have, we all take student loans in order to go to college. And this is just the way it is. We need to rethink that as well. Some people, and I, sh I should be not saying this because I'm a college professor, but there are some people, they should be in a trade. You should just save that money go to trade school, become uh, an electrician, a plumber, uh, heating and air conditioning, and you can charge just as much as my dentist, my doctor, my psychologist. <laughs> you can charge the same amount per hour without going into student loans. But there's a social stigma that says, no, even if it's not for you, you must go to college and you must get your bachelor's degree. And to a certain extent, in, in many different career paths, yes, I get that. You do. Some you don't. But even then, do you have to take out a six-figure loan in order to do that? And this is where I've noticed with, with my students, and I'll, I'll elicit this in some way, and I've noticed I have two camps. We have those who don't pay anything, either through uh, mostly family, some through athletics, and then you have others who are on more or less on their own doing it through work and student loans. And, and some of the loans can get pretty high, and they are starting out their young adult lives way behind in the game. And it doesn't mean that they're, they've lost. It just means they have a lot of catching up to do. And that also means that other alternatives could be explored. Now, if you're in that camp, it's worthwhile having that conversation of going to community college before you go to that four-year university, crunching the numbers. And uh, part of what I'm working on as well is understanding how we get into classrooms of juniors in high school to have these conversations. Because by the time you walk onto campus and learn how much it's going to cost, you've already committed to it. And it's very difficult to get yourself out of that and to rearrange. What we would rather do is have what we call a just-in-time learning where we jump in when you're a junior in high school, give you the education on how much things will cost should you go to college and what is going to be your best route based on your resources. That's what we need to be teaching. But again, this all is bucking social norms. Even one step further, I know I'm, I'm getting pretty, <laughs> I'm getting fired up now because now we're starting to talk about real life purpose and, and how it's getting in the way of some people. I've got a lot of college juniors and seniors in my classes who have done the right things. They've done everything right in high school. They're on their way to getting their degree. And now 
the next step in their sequential order is, what were you? What are you going to do? Got to get a corporate job. Corporate job, sell your soul, work extra hours so then you can work your way up the ladder. Right? This is what the social norms, unspoken rules and spoken rules are talking about what you're supposed to do. Take, take the secure corporate job. Earn that paycheck. And what this is doing is it's making our students very risk averse and fearful. It's building this fearful mindset where they're a risk uh, averse to taking on any risks. When you're 22 years old, take the risk. <laughs> Go for it. You've got time. Learn from it. Take your risk. But also understand you've got your own purpose. You have a purpose in your life that's unique. It's not like everybody else's. And it's up to you. Do you want to follow what everyone is doing and not waver, not make your parents mad, not make your professors mad or your friends like, what the hell are you doing? Don't want to do that. Or, or do you want to go out and pursue what you actually want to do? And that will bring you joy, peace, and happiness. So this is where I've changed. And I know that I try to teach my students to think outside of social norms, to get comfortable living outside of social norms so that they can create their own future based on their purpose and their financial future and not everybody else's. So when I conclude, I provide a challenge. For me, I'm comfortable doing this. I'm comfortable wearing athletic clothes in front of my students because I realize I'm comfortable in my own skin. I'm proving a purpose and you need to be comfortable. You, you can't be comfortable doing a small social norm. How are you gonna be comfortable stepping out when it, it's truly time to stand up and live your purpose when nobody else is doing that and nobody else is saving or investing money, how are you gonna be able to do that when you can't do small things? So a couple of small things that I, I challenge my students to start practicing being unconventional. If you are out and about and everyone's eating dessert or everyone's doing the same thing, either pass on dessert or eat out of order just to mess with people, say, just a bit unconventional, but why are we doing, why do we have to do it in this order? Uh, if you go to a party, what if you don't drink? Again, little things, just planting little seeds here. Leave your phone alone for a while. Oh, that's a big one. Leave your phone alone. Set it aside. Don't touch it for a while. You'll be amazed how liberating that is. But it might come at a cost because you might start feeling separation anxiety. I had my phone away at a mall when I took it to the iPhone store. And I was away from it at the mall by myself for about an hour or two. It wasn't even that long, but I had separation anxiety. And... It was, it was very real. And so I had to really acknowledge that that was a problem. Why couldn't I just be aware and just be at the mall without these distractions? And I've come a long way since then. Leave your phone alone and then finally pursue your purpose. That Think about what you really want to do and get that cemented in your brain and in your heart and go for it. That's the big one. So that's the build up to really pursuing your purpose and living your unique, authentic life that you're supposed to live. And finances are just a tool to help you do that, to give you the power to do that, to give you the security to, to live your authentic life. So with that, I am going to conclude when we come back, we're going to be talking about understanding our retirement 
savings behavior, doing a dive into that. We probably say we've have about three more of those podcasts to go. And then we move into some deeper dives. We're going to talk about mental health and behavioral finance. And we're going to bring on some uh, guest speakers as well. So a lot to look forward to. Hope you enjoyed today's content. Really appreciate you watching today and we're listening. If you liked what you heard and saw, please make sure you like, comment, subscribe. And we hope that this can grow and help and serve as many people as possible. But if you're listening, you've already done the work and I appreciate you. You can always reach me at brianfoltis.com or on Instagram or just leave a comment here on YouTube or on any of the podcast channels that you'll be listening to this on. Thanks again, everybody. Have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you later.